right, it is now seven o'clock. It's time for us to officially get started. So officially everyone, welcome to 60 Minutes in Space. Uh, as you watch the program, if you have questions, please talk, pop them into the chat and we will uh, have some time for question and answers at the end. And with no further ado, I'd like to hand it off to our curator of space sciences, Dr. Kachun Yu. All right, thank you very much, Mitch. Uh, and again, welcome everyone to tonight's 60 Minutes in Space. Uh, where I uh, will be joined uh, by my colleague, Naomi uh, Paquette. And uh, for those of you who um, are not familiar with our program, uh, this is, again, as Mitch says, is um, when we cover the latest uh, space science, astronomy, human space flight, anything dealing with space uh, news from the past month. Uh, basically, um, some of the biggest news, but also whatever uh, manages to catch our eye. And as an astronomer, I uh, tend to cover topics outside of our solar system. Um, and I think uh, Naomi will have a number of stories um, closer to home. And um, I'll um, take up about half the program. She'll take up the other half. And then we'll reserve time um, at the end for Q&A. So if you have any questions, feel free to pop them into the chat. And uh, Mitch will collect them. And um, we'll hopefully answer as many of them as we can at the end. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and get us started. So as Mitch uh, alluded to, uh, my presentation uh, tonight, um, part of it um, will deal with colliding galaxies. And first off, what I want to do is start off with uh, sort of an appetizer, like an amuse-bouche um, at the beginning of dinner, and uh, just um, showcase a, an image that was released uh, from uh, the folks running the Hubble Space Telescope um, at NASA, at the Space um, Telescope Institute. And this is a, uh, a cluster of galaxies um, called ACOS 295. And uh, this is um, often the um, constellation of Horologium, which is a um, small constellation um, in the Southern Hemisphere. So uh, most people um, in the Northern Hemisphere, unless you've traveled to the South and have looked at it, um, haven't um, looked in this part, part of the sky. I'm pretty sure I haven't, but uh, you can see um, literally um, tens of thousands of galaxies um, in this um, direction in the sky. So uh, this image is about two and a half by two arc minutes across, which is um, on the order of about six to eight uh, percent the diameter of the full moon. So uh, if you can imagine looking at the moon in the sky and seeing a uh, kind of a rectangular patch, uh, a little bit more than 5% on, on either side. Um, this is um, what you would see or what you could see if you're looking in the right direction. And what we know is that uh, the universe is filled with the galaxies and the, um, one of the dominant forces in the universe is gravity. And so as the universe expanded, galaxies um, tended to cluster, they um, would pull together due to their mutual forces of gravity. So at the same time that the universe was expanding, gravity uh, was pulling matter together. And so in um, some places in the universe, you have um, extremely rich uh, clusters with many, many uh, tens of thousands of galaxies. And we can zoom in um, to um, one of the galaxies close to um, the center of this cluster. And you can see it's a nice spiral galaxy. Um, with, um, you can vaguely um, make out the spiral arms. Uh, this galaxy is uh, face on to us, meaning we're seeing um, most of, of the disk. And um, there are other um, galaxies. Or, um, so there's a smaller spiral galaxy um, just to the um, right and in front of it that's um, tilted more edge on. And uh, uh, spiral galaxies are disk galaxies meaning um, they're uh, more or less shaped like dinner plates or uh, pizzas. And depending on um, what orientation um, you are viewing them at, um, they can either look like a circle or an oval. But uh, there are also a bunch of other galaxies that are not as blue. So our galaxies tend to have more blue stars, more young stars, but uh, other galaxies um, are elliptical and they have more yellowish older stars. And, um, and then also you can see this really weird um, wiggly shape here, looks um, kind of like a worm in the sky. And what is happening is that um, there's so much gravity, so much matter associated with um, this cluster of galaxies. Um, and, and it not only includes the stars and gas and dust inside each galaxy, but there's also massive amounts of extremely hot gas that uh, floats in between the galaxies. And so all of this mass 
um, acts, acts like an enormous lens that can actually bend light ray, rays um, due to the gravity of this mass. And so that distorted worm-like shape is actually the light from a background galaxy that um, has traveled past um, this cluster, um, this massive um, cluster, and that light is then gravitationally lensed um, into this um, distorted um, worm-like shape. And so that's probably another much more distant um, spiral galaxy um, whose image has been magnified um, by the gravitational lens. And uh, we can also see um, this um, also distant, um, what looks like a spiral galaxy, but it looks um, really distorted. So uh, those, um, the nice clean spiral arms that we saw before, uh, they um, seem a little bit more chaotic. And this is probably due to um, mergers and collisions. So uh, the, all these galaxies are obviously not alone. They're orbiting one another. And when they have close uh, pass, pass bys of one another, um, the gravitational interactions can distort the shapes of these galaxies. And then if you um, zoom in into uh, an, an even smaller part of that image, um, you can see again, um, larger yellowish elliptical galaxies. But again, there are these very strange looking distorted shapes. And, um, and because um, the Hubble Space Telescope is looking off in one direction, um, this pencil beam into the universe, it's actually sampling a really large part of space. And uh, the farther we look, um, we're also looking further back in time because light takes a finite amount of time to travel to us. And so probably what we're seeing is not only more distant galaxies, but we're also seeing galaxies earlier in their evolution when uh, more um, collisions and mergers were happening. And so when these galaxies were being disrupted and they have these crazy chaotic looking shapes. Now, um, astronomers have been interested in studying how galaxies merge um, for many decades now. And so this um, is a simulation put out um, by uh, the Space Telescope um, Science Institute. And what they are doing is they're running um, or rendering a visualization of a simulation uh, first created by Chris Mijos at um, um, Case Western um, University, as well as Lars Hernquist at Harvard University. And um, this um, simulation was first um, created in 1995, but um, the Hubble images that we're uh, flashing to um, were all um, taken and released in 2008. So Frank Summers from the Space Telescope has uh, basically created this animation. And what we're seeing is the collision of two spiral galaxies. So galaxies like our own Milky Way. And as they collide and merge, you can see um, stars and gas and dust being ripped out um, from the, the tidal gravitational forces. And um, basically, depending on the orientation, you can see that um, this collision is, can actually be uh, mirrored by um, galaxies that we observe out in the universe. And so obviously, you know, we um, human beings um, are on this earth for maybe um, 70 years um, on average, 70 plus years, 100 years if we're really lucky, whereas galaxies collide on timescales of hundreds of millions of years. And so we can't follow the evolution of a galaxy collision from beginning to end. But what we can see do is we can observe lots of galaxies out there and we can find examples of galaxies um, in mid-collision and at various stages in mid-collision. And if we can find enough of those examples, then we can um, basically match them to simulations like this. And so um, simulations like this, um, we know um, can be accurate descriptions of galaxy collisions because we can match up frames from the simulation to um, actual galaxies in the middle, in the midst of collision um, elsewhere in the universe. And this is one way that we can double check that our computer simulations are actually making sense, that they're actually accurately describing uh, what is out there. Now, there's um, a very famous um, pair of galaxies called the Antennae, um, also uh, known as NGC 4038 and 4039. And this is, uh, again, a pair of spiral galaxies that are colliding. And um, some of you might have seen um, this in, in a telescope. But um, the Hubble Space Telescope took an image of the, um, the, the cores of those two galaxies. And you can see that here 
And what you can um, see um, are um, the dark molecular clouds. So galaxies, in addition to having lots of stars, they also contain lots of gas and dust. And the dark um, material that you see are the um, densest, um, coldest um, dark clouds. Um, they're so cold, typically on the order of about 10 degrees above absolute zero. Um, the gas in them um, are settled in a way that um, given a perturbation, um, the gas can collapse and um, start forming stars. And the star formation, um, you can also see in the form of the, um, the reddish uh, pinkish blister um, like objects that dot the, um, the, the two colliding galaxies. And these are places where not just a single star or a few stars have formed, but probably on the order of um, thousands, tens of thousands, uh, perhaps even millions of stars are forming. And when you have that many stars forming, most of those stars are low mass, uh, but you also get a few um, much higher mass stars. And it's those high mass stars that pump out prodigious amounts of radiation, lots of ultraviolet radiation. And this UV radi radiation lights up the gas around it and ionizes it. And so we see that in the form of these big uh, pink reddish um, bubbles of hot gas. And uh, you also see um, in the antennae, um, lots of um, bluish, um, whitish um, stars. And those are, again, those extremely massive stars, um, extremely bright on the order of um, a million times, up to a million times brighter than, um, than our sun. And, um, and, and they um, show up as blue. And over time, as the stars form, the, um, the gas that they're born from, the gas clouds that they're born from get dispersed, and then the, the stars um, get spread out um, throughout the galaxy. And so, you, um, and then over time, the, those young blue stars die in supernovae, and the remaining stars tend to be yellower. And so, hence, um, outside of um, those um, bluish areas, uh, the rest of the stars in um, this galaxy um, are yellowish. And um, and what has um, really interested astronomers is, you know, in cases like this, where the colliding galaxies have um, re basically released an intense amount of star formation. Um, there's a lot more star formation going on in this pair of galaxies than is happening in our galaxy, or our own Milky Way. And one idea is that the gravitational forces that are unleashed during these collisions um, help compress the molecular clouds. And that um, basically triggers what they call, tr um, creates triggered star formation and basically creates a starburst. Um, we have intense um, star formation taking place. And so astronomers are interested in what causes, um, what, what exactly causes tr trigger star formation, um, how it happens, and what um, other um, factors lead to um, star formation, not just external ones like colliding galaxies, but internal ones, internal to the galaxy, to the gas clouds themselves. So um, astronomers have been um, creating lots of computer simulations of this. Uh, this is um, from uh, simulations um, dating back more than 15 years from Matthew Bate um, and his collaborators at the University of Exeter and elsewhere. And this is um, showing a collapse of a uh, gas cloud about 500 times the mass of our sun. And um, we're seeing about um, two, close to 300,000 years of evolution. And so what you're seeing is gas um, collapsing due to gravity and certain regions um, as they collapse inwards, um, will be dense enough to actually form stars. And you see them being spewed out as little tiny white dots. And um, these stars are um, gravitationally interacting with themselves between each other, as well as the gas. And so this is a, a very dynamic scenario. You can see how complex and complicated the gas structures um, are. And even the stars themselves, um, are being um, released and um, thrown out in um, lots of random uh, different directions. Um, some of them um, are uh, moving fast enough that they're not gravitationally bound anymore. Um, but then over time, we think that as the gas cloud disperses, um, all the stars in this cluster will get released out into the galaxy. Now, this is a wonderful simulation, but it's also uh, super outdated. And the reason why it's outdated is that it doesn't um, deal with a lot of um, the scenarios that we know are occurring in real 
um, the white colored clouds and real galaxies. And um, part of the problem is that um, when stars form, they also release a lot of radiation. They have jets and winds that are expelled from these young stars. And so there's a feedback me mechanism. You can imagine if there's gas that's falling towards a young protostar because of gravity, and that star starts pumping out radiation and winds and other ways to disrupt that infalling gas, um, you would expect the star formation um, to slow down. And as you heat up the gas um, around the, those young stars, again, uh, from the radiation and from the winds and the jets, um, it also uh, makes the, um, those gas clouds more difficult to collapse because you want the clouds to be cold for gravity to, um, to overcome um, the internal forces of the cloud. So uh, this is, um, isn't, um, yeah, this is great early work, but um, we know that astronomers can do better. So let's jump forward to uh, just about five years ago. And uh, this is um, work from Mark um, Krumholtz um, and, and his group. And uh, this shows a simulation of what um, feedback, radiation feedback from a massive star looks like. And so we're seeing um, the same object. Uh, the top two panels um, are zoomed out. The bottom two panels are zoomed in. Uh, the bottom left is looking from the side and the bottom um, right is looking from the top. And so we're seeing gas flowing in, but um, radiation and winds from the star have actually pushed out. And so you have this kind of an hourglass shape um, where the, the winds and the radiation are pushing up um, and out against the inflow of gas. And so the gas is really only coming in at, um, along the equator where there is an accretion disk. And so this uh, shows you how radiation feedback from a star can actually slow down and also complicate the environment um, where the star is forming. Now here is another um, animation, uh, a visualization based on model runs uh, done again by Kr uh, Mark Krumholtz and his team. And this is um, the same sort of um, simulation that we saw before, but at the scale of an entire galaxy, like our Milky Way. And so you see, um, and, and we're, again, we're moving through um, hundreds of millions of years in time. And what we're seeing are stars in orbit around a spiral galaxy. Um, we're seeing um, the um, regions where um, clusters of stars are forming. And those pinkish, reddish regions are those um, um, clusters um, ionizing and um, heating up um, the, the gas. And then um, the most massive stars are also going supernova. They're blowing up, and that also pumps energy um, in, into the interstellar medium. And so you're seeing feedback from, um, from the heating and the winds from um, new stars. Um, you're seeing um, heating from supernova explosions. And all that results in, um, in at least in this particular paper, um, the authors find that this galaxy has um, realistic distributions of different types of gas, um, you know, both hot gases as well as neutral and, and warm and cold, and, and then very cold molecular gas. And, but <clears throat> let's go back to uh, the antennae. And, um, and, and so what we've seen are basically um, star formation that's taking place um, just internal to the galaxy. So we're um, seeing effects from um, stars forming, feedback from stars forming from um, their clouds. But um, when we look back at, at the antennae, um, what we think is happening is that the uh, collision of these two galaxies is forcing or, or triggering new star formation. And so um, what um, is happening um, when we have uh, these collisions creating starbursts of lots and lots of stars all, all forming at once? And again, remember what I'm saying, uh, what I said earlier, um, the antennae is forming stars at a far, far greater rate than what we're seeing in our Milky Way galaxy. And so one idea that has come up is that um, when you have um, collisions uh, between um, galaxies, again, the gravitational forces can cause the molecular clouds to collide. And one way that can happen is um, if, you, if you imagine a small cloud colliding with a larger cloud, um, what can happen is that that smaller cloud um, pushes into the larger cloud, creates a small cavity, basically that U-shaped hole, and it compresses the gas. It compresses the gas kind of at the end uh, or the bottom of that U. And so this is kind of a cartoon schematic of what, that, what happens. 
And uh, the uh, the authors, um, basically a team led by Yasuo uh, Fukui and Kengo Tachihara, uh, both at Nagoya uh, University in Japan. But um, this is part of a, a huge group of people doing um, work on this in Japan. Um, the bottom shows a, a set of um, numerical computer simulations of the same idea. So phase one is uh, when you have the smaller cloud and the larger cloud before they collide. And then phase two is after the collision, um, when it's forming that U-shape um, layer and the gas is being compressed. The, the two bottom right uh, pictures um, are showing um, a larger portion of the cloud and then also a smaller portion of the clouds. Um, so the bottom right most um, picture um, gives you a clearer um, idea of what that U-shaped cavity is like. And, um, and then here is an, um, a cartoon schematic of what is happening when two clouds collide because we, we're pretty sure that clouds are not completely uniform. Um, they have denser clumps as well as less dense regions. And so you can imagine when two clouds are colliding, those denser regions uh, basically compact and uh, the collision results in them forming um, basically a larger um, shock compressed um, sheet. And um, these uh, sheets can be gravitationally unstable and they can further collapse to form filaments. And those filaments can also further uh, collapse to form the uh, cores that lead to um, young stars. And so uh, this Japanese group, as I said, it's a huge team. Uh, they've been looking at um, cloud cloud, what they call cloud cloud um, collisions in uh, other galaxies like the Antennae galaxy that we've been looking at. And they've also been observing um, galaxies much closer um, to home like the Triangulum, which is actually in our local group. So our local cluster of galaxies, it's only about two and a half million light years away. The Antennae are about 45 million light years away. And then they've also been looking at um, star forming regions um, within our own galaxy in our own Milky Way. And they find evidence um, based on their radio telescope observations, as well as um, observations in the infrared and other wavelengths, that um, there appear to be lots of cases where they see evidence of these cloud cloud collisions. And so let's look at one example of that um, in the antennae. And uh, um, what we're looking at is a figure from their paper. Um, just released um, this past, um, actually a few months ago, back in January. And um, the color part of the diagram um, in the yellows and oranges and blues, um, the, the, the image is um, from a, a radio telescope observations of a gas cloud that is um, moving away from us. And then the contour lines, those green lines um, represent a um, gas cloud that's moving towards us. And um, what they see is evidence that the, um, the, uh, the green lines um, are part of um, or representing a smaller cloud that is punched through the larger cloud, um, the, 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 the colorful cloud. And so um, you can show that if you offset or shifted those green lines. Um, and so this um, other picture shows that offset and you can see the, um, the outermost green borders of that cloud seems to match up really well with a hole that's in the, um, the, the other cloud. So suggesting that um, what has happened is that, um, so you can see you have a green block that's um, flying into that pink block and uh, the green block punches a hole um, and um, you know, these blocks um, are square and rectangular, but the clouds in real life have really complicated shapes. And then um, what the authors also did was they ran a uh, computer simulation to show um, what this you know, might look like to just to confirm that uh, this uh, can be a realistic scenario. So and this brings us um, finally to a paper that was released um, earlier um, this month. And this is uh, from a team um, that includes um, astronomers at Northwestern University, um, University of Texas at Austin and uh, Caltech. Uh, and this paper's um, lead author is Michael Grudix uh, from Northwestern. And what they did was they um, come, came up with um, the currently um, what they described as the most advanced uh, star formation code uh, that has ever been developed. And so it includes all the feedbacks that we've been talking about, jets, winds, radiation, supernova, um, includes um, everything that's important in the interstellar medium. Um, including magnetic fields and chemistry, 
and they include um, all the effects from star formation and accretion uh, of gas onto stars, as well as the dynamics, the orbits of stars. And so here is an animation that they released showing what, um, what happens when you have um, a cloud that's about 20,000 solar masses collapsing. And so we're seeing it um, evolve through time, again, a computer simulation. And uh, what this simulation shows that we haven't seen in the previous simulations is, are, are bipolar outflows. And so this is when young um, stars that are about the size of our, um, our sun or even smaller, they, um, you know, instead of just winds and UV radiation, they actually expel out uh, these jets that shoot out from uh, along the polar directions, along the north-south axes of these stars. And so you can see that in, um, in orange um, in the simulation. And so um, these authors have done an incredible job creating uh, an amazing simulation um, where they're de detailing you know, all the physics that are involved. And what's really important about these outflows is that we think outflows come from um, even the least massive stars, the smallest stars out there. And those are the stars that really dominate. Those you know, uh, are the most numerous. And so if you're not including um, the energetics and these outflows uh, from these um, very not so massive stars, then you're missing out on um, a, an important feedback mechanism in your star formation model. So uh, this is just uh, the first paper that has come out and uh, they'll continue to do uh, more simulations. And so uh, it'll be exciting to see um, what else comes out uh, from their group. So with that, um, that's the end of my uh, presentation. I'll be happy to answer questions later and I'm going to turn it over to Naomi. Wonderful, thank you so much, Kachin. Um, and I'm gonna bring us much, much closer to home uh, looking at our own solar system, as well as what's been going on with space exploration and the night sky. So we'll get this started here by looking at a uh, planet that is very familiar to this particular group. This is Mars, of course, has been a hotbed of activity uh, over the last year with Perseverance, Ingenuity, the United Arab Emirates, uh, sending a spacecraft there, as well as um, now China, not only having a spacecraft, but landing on the surface of Mars. And as of this month, they became the second only country to land and operate a spacecraft on the surface of Mars. So we're going to take a quick look at their landing video here. It's very short. This was taken from the uh, spacecraft Tianwen-1, um, this orbiter will be working very closely with the lander. So you can see that heat shield separation. And it's a very short loop. So we'll go ahead and pause that again. So this was landed. Uh, the rover is called Churong. It landed on May 15th. It's named for the Chinese god of fire. And this rover is about the size of Spirit and Opportunity. So 529 pounds, smaller than Curiosity and Perseverance, which are currently the NASA rovers on Mars. Now, I mentioned this is only the second country to operate a spacecraft on Mars. Of course, NASA at this point has only been the successful space agency to not only land, but operate a spacecraft. The Soviet Union did try in 1971 with Mars 3. Um, it transmitted about half a photo before it died 100 seconds into its mission. And one of the things China has committed to is just like its moon rovers, that they are going to be sharing imagery and sharing information with the broader international community. And so these are the first two photographs that were taken on the surface of Mars. Um, the first photograph was on the left, that black and white image, where you can see the rover is still on uh, its landing platform there. You've got the ramp right in front where the spacecraft would eventually descend. And this was taken with its obstacle avoidance cameras. So this is on the front of the rover. And very shortly thereafter, released the first color image, which you can see on your right there. This was taken with a navigation camera uh, near the rear of the rover. You can see that iconic red regolith. And of course, then the solar panels have also been deployed in this particular image. Now, just a few days ago, uh, last Friday, the rover did drive off of that platform, thus the successful operation of a rover on Mars. And it took this picture looking back at the landing platform. So we're excited for it to get started with its 90-day mission um, and start exploring Mars. 
because this rover has landed in an amazingly interesting location. Um, so you can see here is a map of Mars with all of the different landing locations. You have Perseverance, um, kind of near the equator there, along with Opportunity, Phoenix, which was a lander of NASA's right near the poles. And there, Mars 3 is called out there um, for the Soviets. Um, but this is landed in Utopia Planitia. And this is a region that was thought to be an ancient sea on Mars. And what's exciting is that there's a lot of what we call sedimentary rock or layered rock that could have evidence of past water there on Mars that could help tell that planetary history. And not being in the exact same location of this region as Viking 2, you get some really complementary data which is hopefully something that will happen because Viking 2, the lander, saw a really interesting phenomena of these kind of polygonal shapes in the surface that thought were be, thought, uh, the thought was that it was caused by frost underneath the surface of Mars. Um, so we're hoping that uh, Churong can actually confirm that and investigate further. Um, this is also in a location that is right next to an ancient shoreline as well. So just like Perseverance at Jezero Crater, uh, maybe even signs of past life, we'll see. Now to do all these investigations, they have a suite of six cameras that are on the uh, it, rover itself. There's two panoramic cameras uh, that are, you can see up there on the mast, just like NASA rovers. Uh, there's also a multi-spectral imager, which will help provide information about that terrain, what it's made up of, as well as an instrument similar to something uh, that Perseverance and Curiosity have, which is a laser to vaporize some of those rocks to help determine their makeup and use that multi-spectral imager. They also have a magnetometer, and this is really important because it's going to be working in tandem with uh, the orbiter itself. And so Mars does not have a global magnetic field like Earth does. Um, this is part of the reason we think Mars is not a, a wet planet today, is not covered in water. Um, so it's going to be investigating local magnetic fields, smaller scale magnetic fields. And then finally, there is a suite of climate data they'll be collecting around atmospheric pressure, temperature, measuring wind speed, as well as collecting sounds from Mars. So stay tuned for that. But what I am really the most excited about on this rover is that it has ground penetrating radar. And what this will allow scientists to do is peer about 33 feet underneath the surface of Utopia Planitia and search for pockets of frost or ice, or maybe really briny, really, really salty liquid water. Wouldn't that be exciting to find? So stay tuned over the next 90 days. We'll see what comes up from this rover. And over the next year, as Tianwen uh, completes its mission there. And so exciting to see this international collaboration that's happening. Um, and then beyond that, if this mission is successful, uh, China plans to send an ambitious sample return mission in 2028. So that would be even more exciting to get samples of Mars back here to Earth. So. Lots going on on Mars. Also can't forget perseverance and ingenuity, breaking records with flights as well. So keep your eye on the red planet. But I wanted to bring us a little closer to home and look at some human space flight advances. Now, when we think of human space flight, at least what I think of are NASA, Roscosmos, the Russian space agency, sending up astronauts to the International Space Station. This has been kind of our mode of operation. NASA is now working with SpaceX, which is a commercial uh, private space flight company. But there are several other commercial space flight uh, companies here in the US, and they are making some really stunning progress here in the last few months. Um, and two that popped up that caught my eye this month are Virgin Galactic and Blue Origins. So Virgin Galactic has, is operating out of New Mexico in the spaceport in New Mexico. And they had their Spaceship 2 rocket plane actually crossed what they're defining as space. So that's a 50 mile high space boundary. That's what the US Air Force defines space as. Um, you may also hear the Kármán line, which is 62 miles. That's the international recognized line and boundary into space. 
but they were able to cross that 50 mile high boundary with a manned spacecraft or crewed spacecraft. And this is the first time a spacecraft has been launched so high from New Mexico spaceport. And it allows New Mexico to be added into the third US state, um, the group of states to launch humans into space. So here is a video of that launch. So there is a twin fuselage EVE spacecraft um, that an, makes an airplane style takeoff from Spaceport America. And that rocket you saw there, Unity, is bolted to its underbell underbelly. So at about 44,000 feet, Unity releases from that mothership and fired up its rocket, hybrid rocket engines. You can see that happening right here. Um, and it starts to rise skyward to, it actually made a maximum height of 55.45 miles above New Mexico. This was flown by two test pilots, Dave Mackey and a former US astronaut, CJ, uh, I'm gonna butcher this last name, Sturkow. Um, and so this is definitely still in the testing phase. They were excited that at the top of the ride, they got to experience a few minutes of weightlessness and then saw that beautiful swath of the American Southwest below them and the black of space above them. So you can see here is an image of that launch itself. You can see Eve there, that twin fuselage aircraft, as well as Unity below it. Now, yeah, the goal for Virgin Galactic is actually to sell these seats on their, their spacecraft for commercial flights. And passengers will get a very similar experience to the launch that just happened this month. So next up for Virgin Galactic is to do an assessment of this flight test results. Everything looks extraordinarily positive at the moment, but of course, want to make sure this is 100% safe before putting civilians on board. And then they're going to do another uh, test ride, basically, with four company employees riding along as passengers. Then if all goes well, Richard Branson, the CEO of Virgin Galactic himself, will take a ride as a show of good faith. And heck, who wouldn't? Man, if you're a CEO of a commercial space flight company, take that ride. Now they've actually already sold one trip to space for $2 million. This was a research flight for the Italian Air Force. So that will be officially their start of commercial trips for space flyers. So pretty incredible. And arguably even closer to making commercial space flight a reality is Blue Origin. Uh, this is owned by Amazon CEO, Jeff Bezos. And they are gearing up for that first commercial flight as soon as next month, or as soon as July, excuse me. Now, last month, April 14th, they had a successful test flight of their suborbital vehicle called New Shepard. And they are launching out of their uh, headquarters in Texas. This was their 15th uncrewed test flight. But the importance with this was this was really meant to mimic what passengers will experience on those flights that they sell. So they launched at the time of day that they would launch passengers um, and they included the upgraded crew capsule. Uh, this was the first time, it, it, one of the first times it flew, it actually flew for the first time in January. Now this crew capsule has some pretty important features that we think of when we think of commercial air flight, right? Like temperature control, that seems pretty important. Uh, acoustic control, display panels and push to talk communication systems. And what's cool about this capsule, I think, is it really has a different eye to spaceflight than other capsules we've seen. It has some of the largest space largest windows, excuse me, in spaceflight history. Um, it actually takes up a third of the entire capsule. And all of those seats, you can see hints of them near the bottom of the image there are right up against those windows. So really looking at that end uh, guest experience of having that great view all the way to space and back. And just like Virgin Galactic, SpaceX, you do have a reusable rocket and crew capsule. So here are some Blue Origin empl employees testing out those seats. They've been launching a mannequin up until this point. And what was exciting this month is they released that they will be flying a, a private citizen to space and back on July 20th. So just around the corner. So there will be a Blue Astronaut, Blue Origin Astronaut crew and one seat set aside for that commercial passenger. Uh, they're gonna be of course launching from Texas just like they have with their test missions. Now, this is a very short experience. It's only about 10 minutes in length. So the 
Once that rocket reaches 22,000 feet, you'll have the crew capsule separation from the first stage booster. And then they'll experience just shy of 10 minutes of weightlessness. So a pretty fun experience there. And then about a minute after that, the capsule reach its peak at just over that Carmen line of 62 miles and then have a soft landing using parachutes to slow them down. Now, all of this is up for auction and can be yours for the low, low price of over 2.8 million. Uh, now, this is the online auction from their website. We've gotten to the point where bids are public um, and they are doing this for charity. All the proceeds are gonna be donated to Blue Origins Foundation Club for the Future. Um, but yeah, if you have a spare 3 million, you too can go to space and we'd love to hear about it. Um, now, this is definitely the priciest of our commercial space flight seats right now, although we'll see what SpaceX, um, their commercial all civilian crew uh, ride will go to the International Space Station will be auctioned off for. But ultimately, the goal of commercial space flight is to make this cheaper. Not saying space flight is cheap, it's never going to be that $100 plane ticket. But Virgin Galactic is aiming for a price point of more like $250,000. Elon Musk with SpaceX is even more ambitious. He says you could have a one-way trip to Mars for less than, frankly, what a house goes for here in Denver, between two hundred and five hundred thousand. dollars and 500000 So if you want to move to Mars, I know we have some visitors here from Gale Crater already. So you may be uh, ahead of this, but stay tuned for SpaceX. So keep an eye out. July, this a uh, new Shepard launch, and then SpaceX will be launching Crew-3. Those are NASA astronauts in October. And then that privately funded all civilian SpaceX flight in January of next year. It's proving to be a really exciting next few months. And I wanted to wrap up being very close to home at Lunar Eclipse, uh, as Mitch alluded to, I wanted to see who had had a chance to view that Lunar Eclipse. It was pretty hazy and cloudy here very low on the horizon, but some of my friends and local astronomers were able to catch images. So big shout out to them for letting me share their images that they fought through the haze. Um, some of them taking photos with their cell phones through telescopes, but all really enjoying that view. Um, and a couple other images, this one really struck me. This is a local astrophotographer and uh, generally photographer, Nathan Wood. Um, this was taken from Rainbow Curve in Rocky Mountain National Park. So you can see that eclipse happening right at moonset, which really made it a challenge here, especially if you live on the west side of town being so close to the mountains, um, you really did get to see that full eclipse. And one of my favorite images I saw is from a friend of the museum, John Krauss. Now John's job normally is to photograph rocket launches. He is a space flight photographer, um, really amazing, has made his career so soon out of high school doing this. Um, and is no slouch at astrophotography as well. This was from the deserts of California with a radio telescope in the foreground. Uh, so I encourage you to check out more about him. Uh, if you come into Space Odyssey, he's featured in our My Role in Space Interactive and his Twitter account is just some of the most beautiful space flight and astronomy images I have seen. So take a look there. And then one other photo I just couldn't help but share is uh, this one from Santa Monica, California. What a great use of that foreground showing the, the nice Ferris wheel there and that lunar eclipse happening. And so if you didn't get to take a look, I hope this satisfied a little bit of your viewing curiosity. Um, we have a bit of time to wait till the next lunar eclipse here in Colorado. We'll see a partial lunar eclipse November 18th into the morning of the 19th. Um, and then the next total one won't be till May of next year. But never fear, there's more to see in the night sky. Uh, if you go out and look uh, this weekend, Saturday and Sunday, Sunday uh, right at dawn, you'll be treated to Jupiter and Saturn being close to the last quarter moon out to the south, south, um, south, southwest part of the sky, excuse me there. Um, and take a look, if you have binoculars, you get to see moons of Jupiter. If you have a telescope, rings of Saturn, stripes on Jupiter, a very fun. And then tomorrow night, I didn't have a great diagram to share with you of where to look, but take a look right before sunset and right after sunset, you'll see two of our innermost planets, uh, Venus and Mercury, up in the sky. So Venus will probably catch your attention first. It looks like a very bright star. And then half a degree away, so less than the distance of that moon away, 
you'll see mercury. And it's very faint. They're going to be close enough together that you can catch them with binoculars in the same field of view or even in the same field of view with your telescopes. So I hope you go and take a look and I hope not too many of you were bummed for missing out on that lunar eclipse. I slept in with, with some of you, so I definitely feel that. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much, uh, Naomi and Kachun, for those wonderful presentations. Um, <clears throat> we have, Kachun just posted a um, bunch of information. Amazing. Um, <clears throat> so we have a bunch of your questions. Kachun answered some questions in the chat. You probably all saw that about the role of dark matter in those simulations and colors on Hubble space, tel space photographs. You know what I mean. Um, and I just wanted to add a plug. If you come to Space Odyssey, we do have an, an interactive where you can add your own filters to Hubble photographs and get cool images. OK, so Kachun, we got a lot of questions about the time scale of star formations and galaxy collisions and things like that. Yeah, so the, uh, the time scales um, are actually, um, I can probably um, show one of these um, simulations again. Um, let me um, see if I can get this back. And I'll just, while we're waiting, I'll just remind you all to join us next month on June 30th for our next 60 minutes space. Yeah, so um, simulations like this where you're seeing the collapse of an entire um, molecular cloud, um, they um, can be on the order of hundreds of thousands of years to uh, up to a, a few million years. And, um, and but the, uh, the collapse um, to form an individual star uh, can actually take uh, far less time. Um, that um, can be on the order of um, maybe 50,000 years to um, a few hundred thousand years. And, um, and this is based on um, our observations of uh, star forming regions. Again, um, you know, human lives are so short that um, we can't experience or we can't observe a star being born or, um, or a cloud collapsing um, to form stars. What we see are basically um, instant freeze frames of that process. Um, and so what we do is we observe as many star forming uh, regions as possible throughout the sky. Um, and um, and hope, hoping to catch um, them in various stages of their evolution, and also hoping to catch uh, the formation of a star in different um, stages of um, their uh, of its evolution. And so, so from analyses like that, we can basically make arguments about how long it would take for these processes to uh, to occur. So again, uh, formation of an individual star can be on the order of about 100,000 years, but the formation of the cluster as a whole um, will be closer to um, a million years or a few million years. And, um, and, there, um, and, and what we also find is that um, clusters, as I mentioned before, stars have this feedback mechanism where um, the winds and the radiation and supernovae explosions and the UV radiation all have an impact on the molecular gas. And so we think that, um, you know, no matter, you know, even if we are getting the physics completely um, wrong or we don't completely understand all the details, it seems like all these different factors um, eventually result in the disruption or the destruction of the, of the molecular cloud after a few million years. And so um, no for star forming region really survives much longer than that. Very cool. Very cool. And Naomi, it looks like Jurong and Perseverance are kind of close to each other on Mars. How far apart are they? Are they going to run into each other? Oh, sadly not. No Mark Watney style epic uh, crossing of Mars in those time frames. They're going to stay pretty localized. So Jezero Crater, where Perseverance landed, is I think about 1,200 miles away um, mm -hmm. from Jurong's landing site. So not quite road tripping distance. It's hard with those markers are, are huge and <laughs> the scale uh, with that map. So it is slightly closer to Viking too, but even then I don't think we're gonna cross paths in that 90 days, unfortunately. And related question, how fast do rovers go? So rovers don't actually travel all that quickly. Perseverance is gonna average about 328 feet in a day. So 
Uh, and that's when it's going at a clip. Right now, Perseverance is totally focused on being uh, Ingenuity's wingman, uh, is what I'm calling it. <laughs> and, or her, there's no gender to these rovers. But um, Perseverance is all about like monitoring Ingenuity, relaying that data back. So once it really gets going to start its own mission, you know, a few hundred feet a day, I'm not traveling super far, much less than my Apple Watch thinks I should be traveling. So, <laughs> so if you walk, 5,000 steps, you're probably outpacing perseverance. So you can take confidence in that. Um, and Kachun, we had a question. If the Big Bang sent everything out from the center, how do galaxies get on collision courses with each other? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, you know, the, the Big Bang is basically the point um, where the um, we, we think about the beginning of the universe, um, where all um, of space-time uh, was created and where uh, the universe began to expand. And, um, and even though you know, this um, sounds really confusing, um, there actually wasn't a center to the Big Bang because the Big Bang basically happened everywhere in the universe and everywhere in the universe started expanding from everywhere else. Um, so um, try to wrap your head around that. Um, but um, you know, at the same time that um, the space-time itself was expanding. So you should really think of um, the Big Bang as the expansion of space-time itself. So normally, um, you know, people conceive of the Big Bang or they imagine what the Big Bang is like, they think of an explosion. And uh, normally, you know, when you imagine an explosion, you imagine an explosion going off in the space, like a bomb going off or a grenade going off and there's debris or, um, that spreads out. Um, but um, the important thing about the Big Bang is that uh, it's actually creating uh, the space that fills up our universe, the space-time that fills up our universe. So space-time itself is expanding along with all the matter that is carried along with the expansion of space-time. And um, so, and it does seem counterintuitive that, you know, as the universe expands, you would have galaxies um, forming or, or colliding. But, um, you know, the, the dominant force at large scales in the universe um, or the force that we really understand is gravity. And so even as the universe expands, the gravity from all the matter and all the energy in the universe is uh, pulling on all the other matter and all the um, other energy in the universe. And astronomers, cosmologists have created computer simulations and so, um, as well as um, detailed mathematical models. And this is something that they're pretty confident um, about but even, um, you know, they can um, actually describe the expansion of the universe and show how um, just you know, you know, using gravity of not just matter, but also dark matter, um, the, uh, the matter um, can collapse into um, galaxies. The gas can collapse, form galaxies, and then that gas can further collapse to form stars. And then even as the universe continues to expand, uh, those galaxies themselves can interact with one another, again, via gravity. And uh, hence uh, those um, colliding ga um, galaxy, um, that colliding galaxy video that we saw at the beginning. And so the history of the universe um, is the history of gravitational interactions. So, um, so um, ga galaxies collapse from, from the gas, uh, from the Big Bang um, due to gravity. The, that gas further collapses um, due to gravity into stars. And then gravity forces um, galaxies to interact um, to collide and to merge with one another again due to gravity. And so um, gravity um, helps, um, I mean, basically makes galaxies, stars, planets, and life possible. Wow. <laughs> I'm still struggling with everything is expanding from everywhere else. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, so Naomi, you talked a lot about the experience of these fun space flights. If everything goes well, What's the, is there a practical application? Like how fast can you go Denver to Australia? So these are all suborbital missions. So they basically are going straight up, hitting that Kármán line or that 50 mile marker and then coming straight back down. So it truly is a tourist experience, a really expensive carnival ride, um, but dang, who wouldn't want to go to space? Um, so there isn't a practical application yet. That being said, you know, SpaceX is probably the pioneer looking at those practical applications. Can we get civilians? And is there a reason to get civilians to the moon, to Mars, um, to space stations? I don't know, maybe we'll have space station hotels. Uh, that was certainly popular when I was a kid as a, an idea for science fiction, right? Um, but right now it is just an up and back. 
um, proof of concept. And for Virgin Galactic, this is 15 years in the making. So uh, really incredible to see them having gotten this far. All right, cool. You just jump up, say hi to space, and then come back down. <laughs> say some hi to some tardigrades up there. It's fine. <laughs> I don't know. Um, and Kachun, in those colliding galaxies, are there black holes in those galaxies? And what happens if they run into each other? Yeah, that's another uh, wonderful question. Um, as the, uh, the person who asked the question um, might um, have known, um, there, we do think that there are black holes uh, pretty much in every galaxy out there. And um, because every time that we've carefully observed galaxies, you know, obviously we can't actually see a black hole because um, they're, they're not visible, but we can ob uh, observe the gravitational effects that they have on the stars around them. And, um, and again, yeah, this is you know, how important gravity is because uh, this allows us to understand that um, um, we think that there are black holes in every galaxy. And, um, and what happens is you know, these, um, as you saw in that first animation, you know, uh, these galaxy mergers can, can take hundreds of millions of years and you know, they can get um, into very complex patterns and it can take a billion years or more for two large spiral galaxies to collide. Um, and then to finally merge and to settle. And, um, and in these simulations, what, what does happen is that eventually as the galaxies settle, the cores of these galaxies settle together, um, the um, central massive black holes in those galaxies can also uh, merge to form um, an even larger central massive black hole. So that's one way in which uh, the central massive black holes can grow is from the mergers with smaller galaxies. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you go back to those computer simulations that I talked about earlier, there's actually um, right now, um, people don't quite understand how uh, these supermassive black holes actually start at the very beginning of the universe. Because if you look at kind of imagine what the merger history would be, there actually isn't enough time to create the largest, I mean, to create the galaxies that we're seeing very early on in the history of the universe. They appear... Um, and the central mass of black holes appear to be much larger than can be um, created with um, what we currently know about the um, early universe. And so there's still a lot of work to be done by both the observers, the astronomers who you know, look through telescopes, as well as the theorists, uh, the ones who use mathematics to try and figure out what is happening um, in our universe. Amazing. <laughs> um, so, just another question, what kind of computer is Candle's galaxy colliding simulations? How powerful is that computer? Can my laptop do it? Yeah, I um, mean, I think uh, that uh, the question that I saw earlier in the chat um, also asked about what programming languages um, were involved. And uh, astronomers um, have settled on um, actually a, a, a couple of uh, programming languages um, that are almost universally used by uh, most working astronomers. Um, one is Python, um, and then there are a handful of other um, more obscure languages that astronomers also use. But uh, most astronomers um, will uh, do their basic coding uh, on Python, and they'll, um, they'll run it on their laptops or a desktop workstation. Um, I'm actually one of the few astronomers who, don't, um, who doesn't use Python at all. But uh, for the big uh, simulations that you saw, that involve you know, um, colliding galaxies or that involve collapsing gas clouds with uh, radiation feedback and you know, really complex um, patterns and interactions. Um, those are actually run on supercomputers, um, you know, computers involving uh, thousands, tens of thousands, maybe even millions of computer cores or computer CPUs. And so for, for those, typically um, astronomers were right in much more basic um, languages like C or C++ and some of them um, even right in Fortran, um, although I, I think that's um, dying out, but there are still some Fortran, um, um, you know, passionate people, uh, passionate about Fortran. Um, and um, because, you know, for the most part, if you run, um, want to run um, on the big um, heavy um, iron, um, you have to um, write in uh, languages like C, C++, or Fortran. All right, well, we're just about to the end of our presentation. Um, just want to remind you all, our next program will be June 30th, and we will have uh, returning um, 60 Minutes in Space star Steve Lee will be back with us next month. And as just as a final question, 
what would you do in microgravity? What's the first thing you do in microgravity if you took one of those flights? Naomi. I mean, if I weren't super sick to my stomach, which I no doubt I would be, I would totally do a somersault because I can't do that in gravity. And that just seems like such an iconic move. So hands down. Also, if you're curious, if you want to go on Blue Origins, like in addition to physical requirements, they actually test you to see if you can unbuckle, do something in microgravity and be able to get back into your seat and buckle fast enough as part of the requirement <laughs> for your flight. So uh, start working on some of that dexterity training. <laughs> And Kachun, what would you do in microgravity? Oh, I would probably throw up if I tried to do a somersault. <laughs> so uh, I would um, start playing with water, floating water right away. Yes, yes. I've seen some videos of water in space. It's amazing. Um, well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Uh, this is so much fun. We'll see you next month and uh, check out some of those cool things in the night sky this weekend. All right. Good night, everyone. Well